All right, I'm really excited today. We're gonna to be talking with Kyle Wilson, who's most famous for being Jim Rohn's business partner. And he's actually the, the brains behind Jim Rohn International, which he started in the early 90s. And he's worked with some incredible people. Really excited to talk to him. All right, Kyle Wilson, super excited to have you on the show. Really excited to uh, share your story with our viewers. Um, so thank you for joining us. Hey, Chad, my pleasure. You know, getting to watch you on TV was pretty inspiring. <laughs> so, you know, once I got the invite, it's like, heck yeah, I'd love to come on. Uh, well, look, if I become big enough, I know who I can talk to to be an agent for me and, <laughs> and really get me to that next level. I'm calling you. <laughs> I kind of uh, retired from the agent days, but I might know a few of them. So, ah, uh, cool. Well, look, you and I have gotten to know each other over the last couple of years through the real estate guys, and uh, and I know you've got an incredible story. Um, I wanted to dive into that a little bit, but maybe just for our viewers, uh, if you can just indulge us just for a minute, I wanted to uh, read through your bio because it's really impressive. It'll give people background who haven't gotten a chance to know you. And uh, so, so if it's okay with you, I'd like to just uh, read through this because I, I, I'm pretty impressed. I've known a lot of it, but it's good to succinctly say it so people know. Okay. Um, so you're the founder of Jim Rohn International, your success store, and KyleWilson.com. You've worked with the top names in the personal development industry, including your 18-year business partner, friend, and mentor, Jim Rohn, which is pretty cool as well as Brian Tracy, Les Brown, Darren Hardy, Dennis Waitley, Mark Victor Hansen, and many others. Uh, you're also the host of the Success, uh, Success Habits of Super Achievers podcast, and you recently published a book, which I'd like to talk about a little bit later, uh, with the same title and lessons uh, from these long-term friends and iconic thought leaders. Um, and those include uh, Phil Collin of Def Leppard, Brian Tracy, Robert Helms, and the others we've spoken about. It. A very uh, impressive list here. Um, let's see. Brian Tracy has said of you that you made him millions of dollars. Darren Hardy has said that Kyle's your, your uh, I'm sorry, that you're his go to person for any marketing solution. Les Brown said that you're a legend in the industry. Tom Ziegler said in 20 years that you're the only guy he and his dad worked with that every time under promised and over delivered. And uh, Jim Rohn said that you were his trusted partner and friend. So super excited to uh, be talking to you about this and uh, impressive resume bio, if you will. And uh, thanks for jumping on board with us. Hey, thanks, Chad. I appreciate it. Cool. So, so I was hoping today that we could maybe talk about growing your business and growing your brand. Like you, you're the expert in that. Um, one of the things I've been an entrepreneur my whole life and, and marketing and branding has always been pretty important to me. One thing I never didn't quite realize was how much of that is really important in, in me now growing my business, CSQ Properties. I didn't realize like in the real estate space, the branding and marketing is as important as it really is. So, and, and a lot of our audience is, is real estate investors, um, both active and passive, and then entrepreneurs. So it's like perfect to, to be able to talk to you about this. And uh, as, as I'm kind of going along on my own journey, uh, developing CSQ properties. So, um, so with that, kind of wanted to maybe start off with your... Uh, the story that you've got and these working with these incredible names, what first got you into the personal development marketing space? Well, you know, uh, my, my background was I grew up in a small town, never went to college, uh, wasn't, didn't do that well in school. I was actually doing drugs and uh, had a, a life changing um, shift at age 19, which got me really focused, started my first little business, which was actually a detail shop. You know, I grew, grew up in a small town. I didn't grow up in LA, right? It's a little small town in Texas. And, but, you know, that entrepreneurial spirit started coming out. Actually, the marketing, you know, the, you know, the thing I teach about the will started showing up in my early 20s, you know, where I took a little service station and we became maybe the top one in town, open 24 seven, 10 employees, Wilson's Texaco, where America's stationed, the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but you know, by age 26, I really felt the need to make a change. And I, everything I knew was 
kind of in this small town, Vernon, Texas, great little place to grow up. But I felt the, the need to move, sold my business, sold my house, moved to Dallas, did not have a plan. I was going to start another detail shop, which I did. I did it in a big, huge, the, the Xerox building in Las Colinas. But, you know, through a whole series of serendipitous events, I don't know how else to describe it. I ended up at a seminar. They were looking to hire reps. From there, I, I took this huge step of faith. Uh, the job entailed making 100 cold calls a day, which was pretty daunting to think about that. But that wasn't the scary part. The scary part was then having to go give a presentation, which was, you know, that as something I'd never done and wasn't appealing to me at all. But I really felt drawn to do it. I, I call it a God whisper. And mm. I just felt like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. So I had, and I think we can all relate to this. We've been in a bubble. It seems really out there to go down this path, but we, we feel kind of like almost, uh, you know, I, I'm thankful for the ignorance I had to go ahead and just do it, right? This innocence, it, you know, mm-hmm. in a, uh, not, not arrogance, because I wasn't arrogant, but just a naivety. And, uh, and also, I didn't have a lot to lose. So I did it. I was definitely the least qualified. I mean, he had all this, these people who were very comfortable getting up and speaking, but maybe I was the hungriest. And I guess within a year, Chad, I was the top guy in the whole country, you know, wow. for, for the guy. And the, the people we were promoting come to find out they had all worked for Jim Rohn. And the guy who had hired me had worked with Jim Rohn back when Tony Robbins worked for Jim Rohn. Hmm. And one day he calls me and said, hey, Kyle, the guy that we all have been using his stuff, Jim, is actually going to come back and, and start working with us. <laughs> and so I got to uh, start working with Jim Rohn a year later, and I was running Dallas and Houston and Austin. I was by, doing by far the biggest events. Challenge was I wasn't making any money. And so here I'm the number one guy, and it's such a broken model. I, I now had the chops, but it wasn't... Uh, you know, financially rewarding. When you go give presentations, everyone's trying to recruit you to go work for them too. Mm-hmm. And so you start thinking about things. Eventually, I decided to go out on my own, start my own company. And that actually led to me now getting 2,000 people in a room. And I hired the speaker. So I would hire Jim Rohn, hire Brian Tracy, Augmentino, money's flowing. And I would say this was after three years. So making you know, mid six figures uh, after being broke for multiple years. So I'm feeling yeah. amazing. And then Jim Rohn called me one day and said him and his partner split up. His partner owed him over half a million dollars, actually $430,000 and assured me that they weren't going to get back. It was just not going to work. As I said, the, the model had been broken. So uh, I made Jim an offer he couldn't refuse. I said, listen, partnerships haven't worked for you. Because there had been another one that had lost a lot of money. And I said, listen, I think I'm a pretty good promoter. You're the best speaker. Give me an exclusive on all your speaking and on creating product. And I'll just pay you off the top. You know, so instead of us becoming partners, I'll pay you like a speaker's bureau right off the top. Yeah. And I'll take my cut. And then for products, I'll... It'll be my money. I'll hire the team. I'll do it all. And then I'll pay you a royalty. And so we shook hands on it. You know, it was, you know, it was a better idea for me than it was for him. But he, he said, sure, we'll do it. And that first year, I took him from 20 dates to 110 and uh, tripled his speaking fee. And things were blowing up. And, you know, the thing about Jim Rohn is, I always say he's the gateway drug to personal development. Because once people would hear, you know, so a, a doctor would attend the Amway conference once leave Amway, but have discovered Jim Rohn and discovered personal development. So then I took the systems we created to then go start your success store, which allowed me to then take Brian Tracy and Mark Vicker Hansen and Les Brown and, uh, uh, you know, all these different, Nito Kobein, all these different speakers, Bob Berg, into those same companies and actually even start selling their products too. So now... I have Jim Rohn International, but I also had your success store. And I really understood building a customer list 
right? So even right there, I'm cross-pollinating the different list and the customers. And at the time, the seminar business, I hate to say, was, you know, it was kind of a come into your town and pillage it and take everything they could and then leave town. And mine was a totally different model. I would go mm-hmm. in, build relationships, bring value, never hard sell, uh, leave plenty on the table and get, but the one thing I did get was referrals. And we then, you know, the whole thing about later on building the email list, I was able to build a mailing list. And when I launched the Treasury of Quotes book that went on to sell over 6 million copies virally, the, you know, part of that was being able to access all the Jim Rohn fans and know that they were advocates. And I gave them a tool to now go get that message out. So, you know, even within all of that are some marketing lessons about connecting the dots, building a list and talking to it. Yeah. Yeah. One of, one of my favorite stories about the, the early days when you started, you know, you think of like Jim Rohn International as, you know, really like a well-recognized brand, uh, certainly business development, personal development, like like he's the go-to guy. And, and it's remarkable that the whole thing was done on a handshake, right? And if I remember correctly, you said that that handshake agreement that you had lasted like 10 years before you guys even put things down on paper on what, what your agreement was between each other. Yeah, I was, uh, and, and, and Jim was a known commodity to a, a small group of people, like the people that knew him knew him. Yeah. But when I would go in to speak at companies, people didn't know Jim. They knew Zig. Zig was legendary. Tony was Tony Robbins was definitely making a name for himself. Uh, I because I would quote you know the Tony Robbins testimonial and the Earl Nottingale testimonial to give Jim some uh, social proof. But very few people knew him. But when they knew him, they loved him. And uh, but yeah, I was I was putting on a big event two thousand four. You know Hollywood film crew: Brian Tracy, Jim Rohn, Dennis Waitley, and. Uh, you know, we, we were going all out. I thought, you know, if something happened to me and by now I had a million plus email list and I thought if something happened to me, uh, you know, I'd want my team to keep running this because yeah. there's no one else, you know, wasn't, there wasn't anyone else. So I thought we got to put this on paper. <laughs> so, <laughs> I recommend, I don't recommend doing what we did, but I will say Jim was really gun shy. So I think sure. I played it out the right way. And we were just fortunate during that whole period of time. Yeah. And we, uh, you know, I'm not litigious at all because I think you're only as good as the person you're working with. I think Zig had one of the all time great quotes. He said, never do a good deal with a bad guy. And so that's always kind of driven me. If I can't do a handshake, I'm not going to do a deal. But obviously you want to then paper it up. Yeah. Yeah. So was it about 10 years later when you guys? It was. It was 2004, you know, yeah. and we did our deal in 2003 or 1993. Oh, and he was a little nervous and I made it really simple. It was like a yeah. one pager. Okay. But it was clear I built the empire. So it was his, you know, it was his message. Yeah. And I was the marketing arm with 20 employees and the team and money's flowing. I'm like, we, did, Jim, we got to, <laughs> we, got, we got to put this on paper if something <laughs> happened yeah. uh, to you or me. Yeah. But I was actually worried, honestly, if something happened to me, because sure. what's the business going to, where's it going to go? We had a really aggressive profit sharing. I had such a tremendous team. It's the thing I'm maybe the proudest of that the culture and the team we built and I needed to make sure, you know, everyone else was also taken care of. I had life insurance policy, so I wasn't worried about, that part of it, it was more the team and being able to carry on uh, what Jim was doing. I felt like we had kind of built that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love it. And and coming back to, you know, building, building your brand, which, which you did very successfully. I remember uh, a while back at one of our meetings, uh, you had presented on the, the 70, uh, I'm sorry, the seven marketing principles to build, build your business and brand. I was hoping maybe we could spend a few minutes on going over a few of the key concepts from that from that presentation. Um, I know for for real estate uh, syndicators and entrepreneurs, it, it was very applicable, and I, I felt like there's a lot of good takeaways from that. So, uh, could we go over just a few of those key concepts that you had in that in that presentation? Yeah. So, uh, first of all, I always say marketing's simply about connecting the dots. It's not about being manipulative or clever. And, you know, it's just connecting the dots. And you see some people that are very good about that. I mean, they, 
you know, they might not be on social media, they might not have a list, but they are connecting the dots. And I would say in 2022, you probably are on social media, you probably are building a list because that is the biggest way to connect the dots. The world has changed dramatically. But, uh, you know, I have a whole thing on how you connect the dots, but it's just pretty common sense of knowing who your customer is, knowing who your prospect is, knowing what your secret sauce is, you know, what your goals are, and what are the most efficient, effective ways to now connect those dots. And that kind of takes us to the second one, which is tactics and principles. And tactics uh, change with technology. So the tactics I used in the 90s to fill a room changed in 2000 and changed in 2010 and changed in 2016 and they've changed today. They're always evolving and tactics have always evolved and changed. I would submit people are doing too many tactics. There's too many things and they're so tactically driven. I'll give mm -hmm. you an example in a minute. But then on the principal side, I don't think the principles have changed at all. The same principles that really helped me build a business that compound it. And that's the key word. I see companies all the time churn through people, churn through customers, churn through their team. Uh, they're moving so fast, but they're not connecting the dots at all. And they're very transactional. Uh, I call it hunting versus fishing. The real estate guys talk about farming, which is also something I really uh, agree with having a, a farming mentality. But when we're talking hunting, I kind of do the hunting fishing. And so hunting, you're going after the customer. Fishing, you're attracting the customer you want with what you have. It's not fake. It's it's who you are. What can, mm -hmm. you, can you really help? But the thing about principles is they compound over time. So you, you put something in place that compounds and the principles, this is what, this is, it's so simple that not everyone gets it, but I can tell you Tom Burns gets it and Robert Helms gets it, you know, and Darren Hardy gets it. The, the principles are number one, have a great product. Guess what Apple does? They have a great product, Nordstrom's, mm -hmm. you know, Amazon. They have great, Amazon's great customer service, which is actually number two. But when you have a great product, like the treasury quotes that I moved 6 million of, it wasn't because I was a great marketer. I created the right product and tool that then could become viral. So anytime you create a really good product, it's going to have a compounding effect. The, you know, great customer service, being relational, that's a, that's a big one too. But some other principles for me are I don't do one-offs. Anything that's not going to be have a compounding impact. I don't want to do it. I don't want to put my time and energy on something that I can't replicate over time, or I can't have a reoccurring benefit, or I'm not going to be able to take that and build upon it. That's a principle. Uh, being strategic, you know, doing the things that, you know, one thing will knock down all the other dominoes. Those are principles in mm -hmm. because people are so involved in all the different tactics. They're too busy Doing the little stuff, I remember uh, working one-on-one -on -one with the lady who was the coach to the president of ABC Family in Hollywood, uh, the coach to the president of HBO, and she's mega talented. In our first meeting, she had a list of about 50 things, and she's asking me about video. She's going through this whole list. I'm like, that's all tactical stuff. Can we start totally in a different place? Mm. And we went in a different place and we started, I'm a strategist at the end of the day, because you think about it, what changed with Jim Rohn's message in 1993? Nothing, nothing changed yeah. except the strategy, right? In which we were going to go. And with her, she doubled her income the next year by doing less, mm. but being better and more focused at what truly was important. So tactics and, and uh, principles, less is typically more. And then I always talk about the wheel and that's kind of the foundation for me is uh, I drew a circle in 1993 and uh, it was called the wheel and I put a little hub in the middle, I put Jim Rohn and each spoke on the wheel was an existing product or service. 
And the biggest question is how do you get people on the wheel? So if someone's an investor, if someone's in real estate, it's not just what products and services you have, it's who do you have on your wheel to offer them to. Mm. And yeah. if you can create a product or service that also is customer acquisition, you know, then that, uh, you know, that, that, that was the focus for me in 93. Uh, Jim didn't have a big, there wasn't, I started Jim Rohn International. There was Jim Rohn Productions. It had gone bankrupt. He, he didn't have a big brand, honestly. And he had zero list. I got no list, but I did get a couple of products. I got a book and an audio series and a, and a one day seminar and a two day seminar. And my biggest job is how do I get people on the wheel? And there's different ways I could do it back then. Events was a big one. Getting him to speak for companies was another one. So I had to you know, pour most of my energy into those things. Well, today there's those similar type things that people, you know, whether it's getting on podcasts or attending events, whatever it is, advertising. Uh, but once you get people on the wheel, then how do you create a relationship with them? And when the internet came, you know, that gave us a whole new opportunity as does social media now to reach people we could have never reached before and build a relationship with them. And I'm going to give you two just quick examples. Okay. Uh, one is very much uh, in, in your space. And I remember talking uh, to a, a investor, a guy who was spending 30 hours a week talking to investors, you know, trying to pitch his deals. And he had a real desire to build an audience. He had a real desire to do education events. He had a cause. It was important for him because I said, listen, it's, it's not an easy space to go get into. But if you're really committed and you want to do events and you want to do, you know, trainings and things, we could flip this instead of spending 30 hours talking to investors. How could you attract enough potential investors to pay you to attend your events, to pay you to be part of your mastermind, to pay you to be part of a group type of uh, coaching, if you will. Mm -hmm. Within two years, he built a, a million dollar business on that side, but that, that, that same group then brought him like over 20 deals and we're talking significant deals and they've gone on to kind of build their empire. And same thing, you know, like even with the real estate guys, when they had the big podcast 10 years ago, they weren't doing many events, right? They were, they were kind of doing it in a different space. And so the key is, you know, how can you go build the, build the wheel, but you got to have spokes. And so for them, it was having events. And then from there, having uh, a place to take people to that next level of engagement that then those same people might become investors in some deals that they're offering, right? So yeah. that's a model that's strategic, but it does require taking a bit of a pause and taking a step back. And for me, the will always did that because I had criteria for what a spoke has to be. It has to be part of my core business, it has to be part of my secret sauce and what makes me special. It has to fit into my goals. You know, all these different things that had to be in alignment with for me to even have a spoke. And it had to have the ability to get people on the wheel and cross pollinate with the rest of the things I do. Got it. Yeah, I, I love the idea of connecting the dots because it's uh, it's really timeless. And I think it helps, you know, with your your time horizon, your perspective of really, you know, doing that successfully in the early 90s. And then even doing it today with the the companies and, and people that you consult for today, it's connecting the dots is timeless. Um, so I, I can really appreciate that. And uh, and I it's it's good to hear the stories of just adjusting the strategy a little bit. You know, the thirty hour a week guy who's who's pounding the pavement talking to investors, and you kind of take a little different strategic approach to it. Kind of still working the same amount of time, but do it in this direction. And, uh, and two years later, he's, you know, got a totally different animal that he's, uh, he's running. So that, that's, that's pretty cool to hear. And the reality was, uh, you know, based on what I was observing in the marketplace, he couldn't get there without doing events. Yeah. And there's some other people you and I know, you know, Michael Manthe, they're doing that now, right? They, they're doing their own events, which then opened the door to do 
a mastermind in coaching, yeah. but all that was part of it. In both cases, uh, you know, Michael's case and the other person, you know, they actually started with meetups. And so meetups are a great way to test the waters. Mm. So before you go try and put on a two or $300 event, you, you do have to have a tribe of people. So a meetup is a great way to build the tribe, build the relationship, you know, know that, you know, that's the testing water. And I always say, if you're going to do an event or launch a product, you have to test it. And there's like four key things to testing. And I'm always open to not doing it. I've done some big events that I had a, a method to test it before I wrote the big check to the hotel and the speakers because, yeah. uh, and I'm happy to share that formula, but you know, with, with the people I'm talking about, they did these little measured tests with the warm audience and from the meetup, then they went into their first event, but they had, they had built a community of people, which very importantly was their heart. You know, it was, they were so committed to doing this. This was a yeah. passion and that has to exist in the equation too. If someone's just trying to do it for the money, I, I don't know that it's going to work in today's world. I mean, you have to really connect with people. You got to love on people. You have to, you know, it's the authenticity is either going to show or not show. And so yeah. there's nothing wrong if that doesn't fit someone but that might not be a strategy they would want to utilize if that doesn't fit how they want to, you know, organize their time. Yeah. Yeah. It reminds me of uh, like Russell Gray. He always says humans are social creatures, right? Like we have this innate need that's, that's ingrained in us to, to create relationships with one another and support one another. And, and you mentioned a little bit earlier about, about uh, some of the tactics, you know, getting buried in the tactics and, and just, um, you know, having too much, you know, focus, not focusing enough, spreading things out among too many different places. Um, I definitely feel that challenge in my own business. What are you seeing with the companies that, that you're working with now and the brands that you're working with now, let's say in, in, in more recent times on, you know, like you, we have so many different tactics that are available to us. And, and I know people that have just like shotgun approach and try to do this and do that. Do they do this? And they're doing like a ton of different things. But like, if you had to boil it down to a few tactics that you think are the most impactful on creating those relationships uh, and really providing value to customers, what, how, what would you narrow those down to? Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, I, I have some strong opinions about some of it. Some of it's kind of controversial, but, you know, I, I think, you know, these are just my opinions and it, there's no right or wrong answer. It's what's right or wrong for you. Hmm. But I do think a lot of the agencies and a lot of the people selling stuff are the ones that have actually created the greater need for, you know, it's all, you know, everyone's selling something to help you. Right. And, because of that, sometimes you, we're getting biased opinions about what's really important or not important. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think, I think, for example, all the different social media platforms, my advice is pick the one you really gravitate to that also makes sense for your business. And then most of the time, you can re-engineer it. So mine happens to be Instagram for different reasons. <clears throat> but you know, it also fits my social proof, you know, because Instagram gives you a, a snapshot of your profile. Well, I can do a snapshot with Jim Rohn and Darren Hardy and Brian Tracy and Les Brown, which is also related to my avatar of people that are connected to me. I did one of John Maxwell today, you know, who we hadn't even talked about, but I had a call with John yesterday. So all these different things, <clears throat> So Instagram works really well for me. That doesn't happen as much on LinkedIn or Facebook. And also I don't want to work it. So LinkedIn, I feel like is more of kind of not a hunting, but it's more of a, you know, that's more mm -hmm. of a direct approach. Mine is more of a fishing. I just want to put my stuff out there and attract the people I want to attract. But having said that, I can do one post on Instagram and within you know less than five minutes, I've now re-engineered it for LinkedIn, re-engineered it for Facebook. Same thing on a podcast. I can re-engineer that. You know, my focus is iTunes and Spotify and Amazon Music and iHeart. 
but I can re-engineer it for YouTube. I can also take clips for Instagram mm. and not with, not with a lot of extra bandwidth to that regard, but you know, find the one or two things and then really keep an eye on it. When we outsource those, which most people do, two things happen. First of all, they have no clue what's working and what's not working. So they're not learning. I would submit to you, I would have never built a million plus list if I didn't have the heartbeat of everything that was happening. I knew my customer, I knew what worked, I knew yeah. the language, I was connected. And, uh, but to that end, also I had great systems, Chad. Now I figured those out. I didn't take a course on systems, but yeah. you start learning how to do it. So you learn by doing, right? And, and I will tell you how I do it, exactly how Darren Hardy did it, John Asraf did it. They are the architects of their own marketing. But that doesn't mean everyone should be. I'm just saying, start with what you really have uh, a connection with. Now, if, you, if someone didn't have a connection with any of that and they're gonna outsource it, that gets a little tricky. Mm. So just keep an eye on it. I think slow is better than fast. And just really keep an eye on what's working, what's not working, because you can actually offend the people you're trying to attract by not being relational, by mm -hmm. not. I do say social is about being social. So yeah. I don't want a bot or someone else pretending to be me. Now, that's just how I go about doing it. Yeah. And that that's an alignment with everything else, I believe. I think if you're in the real estate or if, excuse me, if you're in the investing world, Trust is even more important. Being relational is even more important. Yeah. So back to systems, uh, you know, I, I have a lot of people on my wheel. I have a lot of things happening, but I have systems where I feel like I have more time than almost anyone I know <laughs> that has much less yeah. happening with that. Because, but how did I figure that out? By by having to figure it out a way that works for me. But if you outsource that to a third party that oftentimes then outsources it even more to someone that doesn't know you, and I'm sorry, they don't care about you. Yeah. And I'm sorry, they don't care about the people that care about you. <laughs> and you never learn, you're never the wiser. So one example I had, I did a Brian Tracy three year, three day event, 20 year anniversary of a thing he and I created. I did it in 2016 and, Darren Hardy and a bunch of speakers, Ron, Robert Helms spoke there. And I thought, you know, I am going to test uh, like the biggest name, like the biggest guy in the industry on Facebook ads. I'm going to give him X amount of dollars. Okay. I'm going to test because, you know. Now, I'm sorry, was that you promoting the guy or are you attaching your name to the big name? Okay, this was an event. I this was my event, the Brian yeah. Tracy three day success. This was my event. I pay sure. for it. I host it. It's all it's all mine. I'm paying Brian a check. I'm paying everyone else a check. And I'm thinking I'm going to hire the Facebook uh, ad guy. Got it. Got it. And okay. I'm going to hire his team because I sure. knew I was just hiring an agency who has layers of people. Yeah. And. Um, and then I thought, well, I'm just going to test that with my own, you know, connect the dots. Sure. Now, what did I know about Facebook ads? Nothing, because I'd been retired. I wasn't doing Facebook ads. I didn't take a course. I just test it based on connecting the dots. Yeah. How do people respond in the whole thing. So I will say I way, way, way outperformed them. And the wow. reason I way, way, way outperformed them is they weren't connecting the dots. Mm. Oh, like, here's one thing they're running ads, you know, with Brian Tracy and all these different things. And they're focused on Brian and I'm thinking that's interesting. So I'll run my own version. And we were about the same, but then I thought, let me run, uh, let me take one of my blog posts, put a great headline on it, put a, a meme that's very, you know, everyone would go, hell yeah, that's true. And they're going to like it. And a bunch of them are going to share it. And then tell, you know, create some credibility for me early on, you know, Brian Tracy and I are 25 year friends, blah, blah, blah. By the way, if you want X, Y, Z, he's one of my 52 lessons. Here's a link. So now I, so within one 
post as accomplishing six things. I was building credibility. I had to opt in into my own list. I was getting people to like, I was getting people to share. If it's on a business page, everyone that likes it, if you're buying an ad, you can then invite them to like your page, which was building that list. And uh, the other thing is Facebook like content more than ads. So mm -hmm. it was getting a six on a relevancy score. And I literally was just killing them. Now, do you think they would have ever suggested that to me? No, because they don't care. They just want to maximize whatever dollars you're going to give them based on how they do things, right? Yeah. They don't know my audience. They don't have a personal Brian Tracy story, right? And so yeah. from there, I started testing that with everything I did on Facebook. Same uh, concept, yeah. you know, build credibility, uh, give people a chance to opt into something. I did it today with my John Maxwell at the end. I said, hey, if you'd like to copy the Success Habits book, you know, DM here. So, but I, that, those were kind of self-discoveries. Now, the question is, do people have time for that? And I get that. Mm -hmm. Don't. But if you do it once a week, to me, that's better than fake. That's not. And, and you got to test the fake. If the fake's working, great. Yeah. And I'm, when I say fake, I, I'm saying that because I actually do see a lot of fake. I see fake likes, fake, a lot of stuff. So that's yeah. stuff. So all that stuff, you got to be really careful when someone, Jim Rohn would say, if someone's selling antiques, <laughs> you got to kind of question, you know, if they're, they're, they're inventing, you know, they're creating manufacturing antiques, you got to be a little bit careful. So when you said too many tactics, I think it shows up a lot on social media. It shows up a lot by just doing too much. But if you can do a little bit less and test it and find the things that really work, like yeah. Some of my marketing friends that live in that world will test something 50 times to find the very, very best outcome yeah. to then bet the farm on that. Yeah. I mean, you, you're basically doing like A-B testing on a huge scale, right? Like hiring a big agency to go do what they do and then you to do what you do and do A-B marketing testing between the two to see really what, what works best. That's, that's pretty interesting. And, you know, I have a have a, a thing called Lessons from Baseball that has over 100,000 followers on Facebook. Same thing. It used to cost me maybe 80 cents to get a follow on that when I was starting it. And I had a purpose to it. And I kept testing little things. I was curious, right? Mm -hmm. it was all connecting the dots. And I finally found one that was six cents. And that... I mean, you talk about a difference. Now, if yeah. you're moving so fast and you you miss a difference that can have a 10x outcome, and that's what I think a lot of people are doing with tactics. Yeah. Assuming that the people telling them all the stuff is accurate, they're assuming the people care. And then the biggest problem is they're not collecting the data to make an intelligent decision about what's truly working and what's not working. Yeah, got it. Yeah, I mean, it's too much, but if they could get it down to a few things, nail that, then they can go the second thing. Yeah. Go the third thing. And then over time, they build the big, robust machine. Yeah. It, it, it's interesting. I, I, hadn't, I didn't know about your million, million person list before. It's, uh, it's pretty impressive. But I, I think what's most impressive about that is talking about, you know, your, your massive list. But when I've seen you in rooms of several hundred people, like you, you know, the story of a lot of people and, and I don't know how you keep that all in your head. Well, but like, I, no, I sold the million plus list. So that, and I got paid really well. So yeah. I built a million plus list in 2007. I, I had 300 intellectual properties over a million plus email list. And I got, I, you know, a company bought me and I had a five year non-compete. Yeah. When I came back out, I obviously no list and yeah. uh, no intellectual property. And it was okay. And that helped me again. It was a great time to reboot and think about what do I really want to do and be really clear. And just to add on to that, you know, I, I said, Hey, if you got no list, the game has changed. Emails more difficult than ever. Social media is one of the quickest, fastest ways to build an email list. Yeah. You, you, 
you find them through social media, but then you give them reasons to say yes to your email list. And so now yeah. you have them both. Yeah. So, so I guess going along this, this path of email lists, you know, talking about the top of the funnel and then really building those, those one-on-one connections, um, you've done it in a remarkable way. Uh, and a lot of the evidence is in the books behind you. I, I've read a lot of those books behind you and um, the stories that you, you share in those books, the people's stories, which, you know, each person has a chapter in those books um, it is, is awesome. I love it. And, uh, it's a, it, I don't know, it's remarkable how you've taken the, the connecting the dots idea and, and from some, something big with a lot of different people and then distill it down to where even the people in the books behind you, you're drilling down and like the connection is like really, really deep there. And, um, and so much so that, that like that, that story I could go back and ask you about someone from one of your first books and you'll be able to tell me their exact story of what happened. Like that, that connection, that dot connection you have is, uh, is pretty impressive. And I'm hoping one day I'll be in one of those books. Uh, we'll see what happens, but, uh, but, but definitely, definitely appreciate reading those. So you and I, you and I one night had a drink and I got to find out your story and dude, I, I look forward to telling your story. <laughs> you, it's so interesting. And, uh, and it, it is, you know, when I talk about the will, each of us are the center, you know, we're the hub of our own will and we have different spokes. And sometimes those spokes are very synergistic with each other, even though they're very different, yeah. right? You, you being on National Geographic, you know, with a TV series, you know, is going to be very appealing to certain real estate investors, right? It gives you a, a certain amount of social proof. And so, but most people don't even know that part. And again, that's where I always talk about, we diminish our story so much. Yeah. And if we can have clever ways to, you know, like getting Tom Burns to tell people he's the doctor for the Olympic team, or, you know, he owns 6,000 acres of hunting and Africa or, you know, all these different endless stories, he's just never going to do it. Yeah. But we can tell a story in a book, you know, or if someone else can tell it or you interview him, then it can kind of come out. And all of a sudden people go, I didn't know that. I thought that was just this orthopedic yeah. surgeon in there. I remember someone once really bragging about how big a mogul they were in the real estate world in front of Tom, because there was a little side situation going on. And, you know, Tom at the time had 300 million in real estate. He didn't say a word about it, right? But also he's not going to. So to find ways to let people tell their story in a third party way. And that that is one of the many benefits of the books is helping us helping people share that story. Yeah. Well, you, you have a knack for it because I didn't. I didn't think I had a story oh, and, uh, and you've got a knack for drawing it out. And after talking with you uh, <laughs> that night, I'm like, all right, well, maybe I do have a story and Kyle can help me get it out. <laughs> no. And the, yeah, none of us knew the story. So I, it was so awesome in Belize to, to see it show up in a couple of different ways. Yeah. Talent night team one. And uh, <laughs> no, that was uh, that Mo movie, movie night, movie yeah, night. Movie night. Yeah. That yeah, was yeah. Well, movie night, but also, uh, uh, on the uh, secret word contest, got to uh, a little bit in action on that too. So that yeah, was, yeah, 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 that's true. <laughs> we won't say who I was in that. That no, one. keep no. that on the island. <laughs> yeah, percent uh, on that one. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. This has been awesome, Kyle. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us and uh, sharing a lot of these these nuggets of wisdom. Um, what, uh, what are some ways that people can get in touch with you? Or you had also mentioned that the book you have now, is, uh, Su Success Habits. Um, how can people get a copy of that? Yeah, sure. So people can find me at kylewilson.com and to get the, the free digital copy of the book, they can send an email. It's, it's on the website too, but if they want to send me an email to info at kylewilson.com, and just mention this podcast. And uh, if they're a Jim Rohn fan or any of the people we talked about, mention that too. Tell, tell me a little bit about yourself. And when I send them the link to the book, it's I send them also really all these books and a bunch of interviews with Darren Hardy and other people. Cool. It's pretty cool. Uh, 
And, uh, and then they kind of get to see how I lay things out too, you know, because part of it's the, you know, the systems we talk about, yeah. how you then kind of progress that, you know, the yeah. email to then the, the download page. And then they kind of get to see my, they get on my list, right? So they get to start seeing my stuff. Yeah. And my stuff is very much just bring value and then occasionally give people something to say yes to. Okay, cool. And, and you also uh, have your inner circle mastermind group. Do you always still have room in that for people that are interested? Yeah, I mean, that's an application that they can fill out on the okay. website. And, uh, and same thing with the book. It, they're both applications. And then we jump on a call just to make sure it's going to be a good fit for them, a good fit uh, for us. And uh, but yeah, always open to taking any applications from people. Yeah. All right. Well, I'll, I'll get on there. I want to get my application <laughs> in to uh, join you on a book. So I appreciate uh, you talking about that. And, and this has been great. So I really appreciate you uh, sharing with us, us your stories and congratulations on, on all your success. Chad, thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Okay. Talk to you soon. Sounds good. Okay. You've heard it straight from a guy who's worked with some of the biggest names in personal and business development. Sometimes you got to keep it simple and connect the dots and it comes down to relationships. Hope you enjoyed the show and please click subscribe below. And if you have any comments on the interview, let us know.